If you're cheating on your spouse, it's not a matter of when. You might be real good at it. It can go 10, 15, 20 years. You're going to get caught. I pray you get caught. Can't wait for you to get caught. I'm not a hater. I'm just saying you can't find health and restoration and redemption and forgiveness and peace and purpose until those things that are done in the dark are brought to the light. So I can't wait for you to get busted. I'm literally praying on your downfall. One of the most uh, powerful stories that I heard while I was in Uganda is traditionally men don't carry water, right? So in order to get water where you're at, you have to walk kilometers, right? Who here's ever ran a 5K? Anybody? Where's Richard? I don't know. He's been ran a couple 5Ks. That man ran a marathon the other day. Who, yeah? So a, a 5K is what? It's about three miles, 3.1 miles, somewhere around there. Many times, people are having to go 5, 10, 15 kilometers in any direction to get water, in any direction to get to a road, in any direction to get to help, hospitals. Like if something happens out there, you get bit by a lion that's literally, like literally roaring to devour you, like you might not get the help that you need. And so traditionally, women will walk to these watering holes and they will carry the water back to their homes. Women and children. So young men can do it until they reach the age of puberty and then they graduate into man status and they no longer carry anything. And for me, as I'm sitting there, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Our whole family, bro, I'm thirsty. Our whole family should go down there, right? I could probably carry two of them. Everybody, we're going to go as a family. It just don't make sense. Oh, I'm too good. I'm a man. I'm not going to carry any water. Now, that's their tradition, and I'm not here to, like, I'm not here to judge that. So I was asking my guide, I was like, what is, what is the idea behind that? They go, it's tradition. It's just the way that things have been done. But the gospel has come into this, uh, this community, and it's changing tradition. It's changing the way things are being done. The marriages are in all kinds of, there, there's a lot of strain on the marriages. There's not a lot of respect for the women in the culture. And so they bring the gospel in, and you're hearing these stories of them reading it, and it's talking about husband, love your wives, to serve them, to protect them. And it's changing the makeup and the ideology and the way that relationships are being done. The gospel has the power to change. And so as I'm there, we're, we preach, and then we're walking down to this mango tree to have a meal. And as we're getting up, they're saying, hey, we need to grab some chairs. So I grab three chairs and I'm walking out and the ladies are looking at me like, no, 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 put the chairs down, put the chairs down. And I was like, I'm not gonna put the chairs down, I'm gonna carry the chairs. And even some of the guys, they go, hey, we don't have to carry the chairs. And I'm like, well, how, who's gonna carry the chairs? Who's gonna carry the chairs? In my David Goggins voice, who's gonna carry the boats? Who's gonna get these down there? And we're looking at the kids and the kids are carrying them. And I'm like, no, man, where I'm from, the, the pastors, the leaders, the husbands, we serve. We lead by example. And so I grab three chairs and I put it on my head and I start marching down there and I'm walking and I see in front of me, there's no men carrying chairs. And I was like, well, maybe I'm being disrespectful to their culture. I, and I don't want to do that. And so I look behind me and I start to see other men picking up chairs. I see other men picking up chairs. Hey, but then I saw a six-year-old girl with six chairs on her head, and I was embarrassed. I was like, you're going to out-chair me? Like, are you serious? She was like, how many you got? Three? She's like, ah, double that. Ah, no hands. And she's like balancing it on her head, and I was like, okay, I get the point. Um, but the idea here is that the gospel transcends tradition. Jesus Christ transcends Tradition. Now, this is where we're going to kind of, I was talking about this will be a wild ride. We have been preaching through the book of 1 Corinthians, chapters 1, 2, and 3. We ain't done. So I've weaved this into the message. We're going to pick up in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. It says this. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. Verse 4 says, For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. I share that, and we'll stop right there for just a second and talk about this is because as we've been unpacking 1 Corinthians, this is a letter from Paul to the Corinthian church. 
And again, he's talking about, hey, the leaders aren't important, right? We have a job, and don't get me wrong, I'm not taking away anything that we're doing. But some days, I feel like I should stand down here and preach. Because what I don't want it to ever come off as is that I'm on a pedestal, or I'm higher than you, looking down at you guys. Because in the eyes of God, I am a man and a servant, just like every single one of you. There is no pedestal. Our culture has put pastors on these pedestals and almost made them untouchable. I hear about infidelity, moral failures, marriages falling apart, and these men still have ministries. They're living duplicit lives. They're living lives that don't line up with the scripture. They're not serving. They want the best seats. They want the honor. They want the praise. They want the glory. And that's not the way that this was ever meant to be. And so I try to live with a sense of humility, a sense of being a servant. I love what Paul says, let a man so consider us, verse one, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. I am just a servant of the gospel. I am just here to help, to point, to guide. Anybody work at the airport? Right? You know what I'm talking about when it, the, the, the people who are guiding the planes? There's these big planes coming in, and they've got the little lightsabers, and they're like, come this way, no, this way, no, no, back it up, wait, stop, go this way. That's all I am in the spiritual. I'm just a guy who's guiding you guys. Hey, go this way. This is right. No, this is wrong. No, immorality, wrong. Stop cheating on your wife. Stop doing this. Stop getting drunk. Stop staying out so late. I'm here pointing at things, leading and guiding. Okay, no, that's the way. This is the way. Jesus is the way. I am no different from any of you. I still have struggles. I'm still tempted. I still have bad days. Some days I might still use sign language on the freeway. <laughs> and if any of you ever run into me and I do that, I apologize in advance. I'm working on it. It's a work in progress. Pray for me. We're servants of Christ, not to be exalted. This isn't going to be on the screen, but the first verse that I think of is Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As a pastor, as a leader, whether, and listen, whether you're a leader in your home, a leader in your workplace, a leader in your school, a leader on your sports team, whatever it is that you're doing, if you want to be an effective leader, then you have to serve. I get here at 7.30, maybe 7.45 today, it's supposed to be 7.30. We had a little snafu with our babysitter, but I got here at 7.45 this morning. And there's not one job that is above me. I will sweep. I guarantee people have seen me sweep. I make coffee. If it wasn't good, I didn't make it. But if it's good, I did. Okay? That I, I'm here lifting things and carrying things. Like, there's no job. I'm not a pastor who's just going to sit in a green room while everybody else does the work because I've been called to serve. Jesus didn't come to throw stones. He came to wash feet. And that's what we're called to do as well, to wash feet and to serve, to serve one another. Programs isn't the point of what we're doing here, to have another good outreach, to have another good fund, another good uh, uh, fundraiser. Like, people is the purpose. People is what this is about. Loving people is what this is about. Introducing people to Jesus. Life change. It's about people. Verse 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says this. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. We need to stop putting our stamp of finality on people, on careers, on relationships, and things that we don't know about. Everything that you see is not everything that is. We have, a, we, have so, we have so much short-sightedness. We will walk into somebody's life and not realize what chapter we're walking in on. We might try to end their story when God's just getting begin. He's just beginning. What we might do is we will put a period where God's just trying to put a comma. We are so quick to judge people based on where we walked in on their story. We've got to do a better job. Listen, therefore, judge nothing. Judge nothing before the time. Until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things that are hidden. Everything done in the dark will be revealed. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. If you are 
not doing your taxes right. It's not a matter of if. You will be audited one day, and you will have to pay for that. If you're cheating on your spouse, it's not a matter of when. You might be real good at it. It can go 10, 15, 20 years. You're, you're going to get caught. I pray you get caught. Can't wait for you to get caught. I'm not a hater. I'm just saying you can't find health and restoration and redemption and forgiveness and peace and purpose until those things that are done in the dark are brought to the light. So I can't wait for you to get busted. I'm literally praying on your downfall. We're judging prematurely and not realizing where we see a life that looks like it's at the end, but God is just getting started. We have to be slow to judge. We are so quick to judge situations. I'm guilty of it. We judge people from the jump. You see somebody come in and you're like, oh, I got them figured out. Do you? Like you got it like that? You know everything? We got to do a better job. We got to do a better job. Verse 14 through 16. Again, 1 Corinthians, I was just, there's a lot to unpack, and uh, we didn't have enough time, but I didn't want to not go through it. Some of the things that he talks about is being a fool for the sake of Jesus and how spiritual success is not equal to worldly success. What we judge success by is not what the world judges success by. I think of the prosperity gospel, and we'll come back to that verse. We can put it back because I'm going to go on another tangent over here. Um, the prosperity gospel says if you have faith and if you believe, then God's going to bless your situation. I, I call, I, I was going to say something, I call, <laughs> no, I call BS. I do. Um, if that's the case, then what you're telling me is that my brothers and sisters in Uganda have no faith. They have no faith? When what I saw was more faith in a grass hut and a mud floor than we have in the biggest, nicest buildings. More faith. So if for one moment you think that God doesn't hear you or he doesn't love you or he's not with you because your situation doesn't reflect what it is that you're praying about, you couldn't be further from the truth. Your faith is not dependent on your blessings. Your faith and, and God's goodness isn't dependent upon your circumstances and what he's done in your life and for your life. Because that's what we like to do. Oh, well, God's good on the mountaintops. When that tax return comes in, oh, praise Jesus, he's good, right? Got an extra 5,000. I'm going to throw some rims on my minivan and get a TV from Walmart, a 70-inch. God's good in those moments. God's good when the diagnosis or the health scare comes back negative. God's good when he restores my marriage or relationship, right? God's good in these moments, but I'm here to tell you that God's good when the tax return comes back and you owe. He's still good. God's still good when the health scare turns out to be worse than you thought. He's still good. When the relationship doesn't get worked out, he's still good. God is just as good on the mountaintops as he is in the valleys. And what we have to do is stop relegating his goodness based on our circumstances. We've got to do a better job of that. Verses 14 and 15. They say, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. Just to recap, again, this is a letter from Paul. Paul is a church planter. He planted this church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians is a letter from Paul, the church planter. He's writing to the church. He's gone to plant another church because that's what he does. Every book, that, most of the books that you're reading here, uh, Colossians, that's a church plant that Paul planted. And he's writing to the church of Colosh, uh, Colossus. And it, he's, it's a... <laughs> He's writing the book to the Colossians, um, Thessalonians. He planted a church in Thessalonica, and he's writing to the church. So here he's writing to this church that he's not at. Right now he's actually in Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. So he's sitting in Ephesus writing this letter to the Corinthians, and he's saying, look, I'm not writing these things to make you guys feel bad, but as my beloved children, I warn you. As a leader, if I'm saying something that you're like, oh, that don't feel good, that don't feel nice, like, oh, that actually is talking to my situation, it's not because I'm trying to shame you. I'm trying to warn you. I care for you. I want to snatch you out the fire. If anything that I share pulls you back to reflect at your situation and doesn't, and doesn't allow you to keep charging forward into sin, then that's a good day on my behalf. I'm here to warn you. So I'm going to share some things. Verse 15 says this. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers, 
For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. He's saying, you, there's a lot of people out there who you guys are listening to. You're, do, you're listening to a lot of this. And I think that this resonates with today's church. Because many people are on YouTube. Well, I'm watching a little Furtick. I'm watching a little Todd. I'm watching a little Stanley. I'm watching a little bit of this and that. Well, I listen to a little bit of Frank Turek. And I listen to a little Billy Graham. And I listen to a little Tim Keller. And I listen to whoever. And there's nothing wrong. I'm not, I'm not here saying anything's wrong with any of those people. But we have too many instructors. We've got too many voices that none of you are actually rooted or grounded in truth. You have no authority. You have no accountability. And you have no spiritual father. And so how can anybody speak into your life when some of the things that I'm speaking, well, that's not, what, that's not what he said over here. And what we've done is created this smorgasbord of spirituality where we pick and choose what tickles our ears and what makes us feel good. And I'm calling you guys higher to a place like, look, you've got a lot of instructors, but you don't have enough fathers. Find some roots. Find an anchor. Drown out some of the noise of some of those opposing voices and commit. Commit to a church. Commit to a family. Stop bouncing around. Stop bouncing around. And it don't even got to be here. This isn't, my, this isn't me trying to, I need you guys here. No, I don't want anybody here who doesn't want to be here. Find a place where you can get a spiritual father who will speak into your life and will start to help guide you and warn you and lead you and hold you accountable. As a Christian, that's all that I want for you. I want that for you. And so Paul wants this as well. He wants this for the church in Corinth. He's saying, hey, look, you don't have many fathers, but in Christ Jesus, I've begotten you through the gospel. He planted that church. He was the primary voice in that place. He's like, so that's, that's kind of like me. And if that's me for you, then he's saying what? Imitate me. Do what I do. Live like this. What I love about this is he says this again in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, says this. Watch this. He says it again, imitate me. But he adds something. He says, just as I also imitate Christ. So he's not saying just follow me wherever I go. He's saying follow me as I follow Jesus. Because that's who we should be imitating. That's who we should be looking to. And we want to have lives that do the same thing. We want to live lives where we say, hey, follow me as I follow Jesus. Isn't, isn't that all that any of us are here doing? Doing our best, trying to imitate him and to get other people to imitate us as we imitate him? Each one reach one. Each one teach one. Each one of us do your best to follow Jesus. And some of the teachers and some of the people, some spiritual fathers, and we'll all pursue him. And then I'm going to bring some of you guys, and then you guys bring some people. And all of us, we've got our eyes on Jesus, and we're following him. It's a beautiful picture of discipleship. It's a beautiful picture of community and a beautiful picture of what it looks like to be the family of God. Amen? Amen. I'm not perfect, but I know someone who is, and his name is Jesus. You might be asking yourself, well, how did Jesus live? How did Jesus live? I want to turn, and I've, I think we were here a few weeks ago, to Micah chapter 6. I love this. I, I absolutely love this verse. Chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. It gives us insight and in how Jesus lived. Verse 6 says this, and it's kind of smart, Alec, right? Who likes a little bit of sarcasm here? I know some of y'all because I've talked to some of you guys. Smart. You're quick with it. But he says this, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? He's like, what, 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 what should I be doing? What do I bring to bring in front of God? What is it that he wants me to do? And he says some things. He goes, shall I come before him with burnt offering? With a calf, a year old? With the Lord? With the, will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams? Ten thousand rivers of oil? He even says, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You, can you feel the snark in that? It's like, what does God want from me? Does he want me to fast for seven days? Does he want me to give 100% of my income? Like, what does he want? He wants me to go a life of celibacy, never to have sex again? He's, he's sitting here like, what is it that God wants? What does he want from me? Because I'll gladly give it. I just want him to tell me. And he does in verse 8. He says, he has shown you, oh man, what is good. How could God show us? 
He came as Jesus and lived a life and set the example and set the precedent and then gave us his Holy Spirit so that we can accomplish this. He has shown us how to do it. He says, he has shown you, oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To do justly, he means, hey, do what's right. It's that simple. When you have the Holy Spirit in you, you know the difference between right and wrong, whether you want to admit it or not. To do what's right. To love mercy means to have compassion and forgiveness. To have mercy means that I am well within my right to do something, to take retribution, to enact punishment, but I choose not to. Oh, I can let my spouse have it. She's wrong about this one. I even Googled it. And I know that she's wrong about this. I got the receipts. And so I stomp in there. You know what? As a matter of fact, it says. But to have mercy, right? I know some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. But to have mercy is to have compassion and to have forgiveness. And not to take that umper hand. And not to take advantage of those situations so that you get the last word or so that you're right or that you really showed them. That's not what Jesus did. He was well within his right to smite every Pharisee and Sadducee that stood up against him. He had every right to just demolish the Roman soldiers. He had every right, but he had mercy, compassion, and forgiveness. And then lastly, it says to walk humbly with your God, to have a low regard of who you are. There was only one person who deserved all the worship in the history of creation, and that was Jesus. And like I said in Matthew 20, what did he do? He came to serve not to be served. If anybody had the right to boast or to walk around like a peacock or to have their chest poked out, like that was Jesus, but he didn't. He showed us how we should live. You're at, well, what should I do? Hey, do justly, do what's right. Love mercy, have compassion and forgiveness with people and to walk humbly with your God. The bottom line of what I'm preaching, because we're talking about Uganda, we're talking about service, we're talking about missions, we're talking about serving, we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about all of these things. Listen, it comes together like this. How you live matters. And what you live for matters. What are you living for? Is it the newest car? Is it the newest house, the biggest house, the newest shirt, the nicest belt buckle? None of those things are wrong. I wear a size 13 if you want to shoot me some kicks. Not even going to lie. But life is about so much more. How you love matters. Global missions are just as important as local missions. The way that we spend our time here on this earth is of the utmost importance. And I'm talking to Christians, right? Because what I shared with you in Micah chapter 6, that's not how you get saved. You get saved only by confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. That comes by faith. But I'm talking to a bunch of people who have put their faith in Jesus, have made that decision, and now are wondering what to do with this life. This is the path to sanctification. This is what we do after we're saved. This is what we do once we're in relationship with Jesus. This is out of Proverbs chapter 10. I've got 10 of these that I want to share with you. The first one is this. This is verse 7. It says, The reputation of the righteous becomes a sweet memorial to him, while the wicked life only leaves a rotten stench. The reputation of the righteous, how you live makes a difference. The legacy that I want to leave is not necessarily a legacy of money and funds and endowments and, and, and different organizations. I want to leave a legacy of loyalty to the Lord. I want my reputation. I want to be known as somebody who was a man of his word, who followed through, who finished well, who didn't compromise, who didn't change up when things got good. I want to leave a legacy that points people to Jesus. And the reputation of the righteous is a sweet memorial to him, while the wicked life only leaves a rotten stench. Verse 8 says, the heart of the wise will easily accept instruction, but those who do all the talking are too busy to listen and learn. They'll keep stumbling ahead into the mess that they created. Are you willing today to be corrected? Are you willing today to hear instruction? Or are you too busy doing this and not enough of this? Right? God gave us two ears and one mouth because we should be listening twice as much as we speak. 
Verse 9 says, the one who walks in integrity will experience a fearless confidence in life. But the one who is devious will eventually be exposed. We talked about integrity and everything done in the darkness will come to light. But when you're living a life, listen, I'm not looking at pornography. I'm not in the bathroom doing things that I shouldn't. I'm not swiping. I could, I'll give you my phone and you can look at my search history. You can jump on my search page on Instagram. And you know what you're going to see? You're going to see cats. You're going to see sports. Listen, don't laugh. I like cat videos. You're going to see sports. You're going to see workout stuff. And you're going to see Christian memes. You're not going to see Instagram models and, and all that stuff. I live in integrity. I'll invite you into my home. The way that I treat my wife in public is the same way I treat her in private. And because I live in integrity, you know what I have? I have a fearless confidence. Because when you don't have that fearless confidence, you're waiting to be exposed. That is a terrible way to live. That is horrible. You're waiting for somebody to stumble upon your search history. Right? Have you, it's even a joke. Like, if I die, bro, delete my search history. Like, that's a whole thing. And people love that. Because they recognize that they're looking at things and doing things and living a duplicit life. They're doing things in the dark that they would never want people to see. The one who is devious will eventually be exposed. Hear that correction. You're being warned. You're going to be exposed. Change the way you're living. Start living with integrity. Stop lying about everything. Christians, oh my God, Lord help me, Jesus, Holy Spirit. People will lie to get out of things that they've made commitments to and then think that's okay. Listen, if you don't want to go to brunch, just say that. Stop lying. How many times is your grandma going to die, right? How many times, like my grandma died. It's like she died three weeks ago. How is this constantly happening? How many times are you going to lie and make excuses? That's not integrity. As Christians, we got to do better. And it starts with even the small things. Next verse. Verse 12, hatred keeps old quarrels alive. But love draws a veil over every insult and finds a way to make sin disappear. If you're in this place and you've got a grudge with somebody, some of you ain't talked for 10, 15 years because somebody did you wrong. At some point, you got to allow love to wash over that sin and that hurt. You are living in unforgiveness. No, I forgive them. Do you? You can't even stand to be in the same room with them. And you love them? Hatred keeps old quarrels alive. You are in disobedience. You're in unforgiveness. And you're not walking in the fullness of what God's called you to walk. It finds a way to make sin disappear. It rebuilds those burnt, burnt bridges. It doesn't mean, listen, and hear me close. It doesn't mean that you have to have full and total relationship with somebody. I have boundaries, and that's okay. I can forgive somebody. I can love somebody, but I can just not rock with them. That's okay, because I need to protect my space and I need to protect my peace, but I love them and it's all good on sight. So I'm not saying that you have to invite people into your life who've done you wrong so they can continue to do so, but what I'm encouraging you to do is to know, hey, if I can't even stand the sound of their voice, some of you guys know what I'm talking about, it's like, it's like fingers on the chalkboard, you're just like, ah, oh, I can't even, uh. that means you're still probably an unforgiveness, friend. Verse 14, wise men don't divulge all that they know. But chattering fools blurt out words that bring them to the brink of ruin. Verse 19, if you keep talking, it won't be long before you're saying something really wrong. Prove your wise from the very start and bite your tongue. Like I said, we're doing a lot of this. When well, we need to be doing a lot of this. A couple more. Verse 17 says, if you readily receive correction, you are walking on the path to life. But if you reject rebuke, you're guaranteed to go astray. Do you have people who can correct you without you getting into your feelings? Do you have somebody who can hold you accountable without you taking it personal or getting defensive? So many of us say, oh, I want to be corrected. I want to be changed. But you have people in your life, as soon as they try to call out what they're seeing, you start to get mad. Oh, well, you're going to talk me out about that. But what about the thing that you did back in 1992? I know about all the things that you did. You start bringing up old stuff. Get yourself around people who can hold you accountable, who can give you correction. And I think that's why a lot of people aren't committed to one church or one body is because they hop around, live in multiple lives, pretending to be things that they're not. There's zero accountability. They don't have to serve. They don't have to give. They just hop around. They hear the word and they go back to their denizen 
and they do what it is that they want to do in the darkness. I'm calling you higher today. I'm calling you out of darkness today. I'm asking you to get rooted today. I'm asking you to get anchored today. I'm asking you to go further with the Lord today. Two more, and I promise I'm going to get off the stage. It says in verse 25, the wicked are blown away by every stormy wind. But when a catastrophe comes, the lovers of God have a secure anchor. The wicked are blown away by every stormy wind. Every bad text, every bad email, every bad news, every time things don't go their way, they're blown around. I like the imagery that the Bible talks about, like a leaf blown about on the waves. You think of a little leaf, and it's just getting tossed around on the waves. That's the person who doesn't fear God, who doesn't love God, who doesn't have faith in God. But for me, regardless of what comes knocking at my door, good news, bad news, ups and downs, I'm anchored because I have Jesus Christ as my firm foundation. Last one, and we're going to pray. Verse 29, the beautiful ways of God are a safe resting place for those who have integrity. There's that word again. But to those who work wickedness, the ways of God spell doom. This is a book filled with good news. For those who are perishing, those who are perishing and do not have a relationship with the Lord, there's good news here. There's good news in the word. The way of hope, the way of comfort, the way of peace, the way of joy, the way of happiness, it's all found in here. But for those who do not know Jesus, there's a lot of bad news. Not a lot of good things are coming their way. Because the truth of the word tells us that the, sin, the penalty for sin is death. Thank you for watching. When you tithe, donate, and contribute, you're partnering with Royal City Church in preaching the gospel around the world. So thank you. Before you go, make sure you turn on the notifications and hit that subscribe button. And do me a favor, share this with at least one person. You never know who might need an uplifting message. If nobody's told you today, let me be the first. I love you, and God does too.